and today we will be sharing our research project Material Futures uh, about experimental fabrication of bacterial cellulose as a new textile material. The research team uh, includes myself uh, and and Professor Francis Joseph. It also includes uh, Raj Nayak, uh, an associate professor from RMIT, and also our wonderful research assistant, Jiang Chan, uh, who's worked very hard with us. So today we will have a presentation about what is bacterial cellulose, uh, or kombucha. Uh, why should we care about it? Um, why did we undertake the research project? Uh, how did we do it? What did we do? What were the sorts of results we came up with? And then we'll have some time for you to hopefully explore the materials um, library that we've brought along today uh, and tell us what you think about our new materials that we've grown. So the area of biomaterials research is evolving uh, as the experimental approach leads to new understandings about how we can design, develop and use them. However, there is currently limited research in biomaterials developed here in Vietnam. In particular, the potential of using our local food ingredients and local crafted drying methods to develop materials derived from kombucha or fermented tea. Early research investigations by Francis and myself highlighted the potential of the new hybrid materials using sources local to the New Zealand environment. This research project aimed to investigate the local context of potential of growing and drying biomaterials to be a potential source of raw materials to replace the existing synthetic materials that we so often have today. Based on this above, um, on this research gap we've just highlighted, this project is based on the following research questions. Uh, what are the potential design outcomes of growing, harvesting and drying kombucha materials here in Vietnam? How do the different ingredients such as teas, sugars, uh, uh, how do, could we use them to grow kombucha and how might they alter the tactility um, or the other properties of the new biomaterials? And what are the potentials of replacing these existing raw materials with the new bio-based bio materials derived from kombucha for different applications? So when we talk about biomaterials, we often... Very often people actually confuse bio-based with biodegradable and biocompostable. Uh, so it's really important to actually start with a bit of a definition. Um, because a material is bio-based, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's biodegradable or biocompostable. Very often when a material is bio-based and biodegradable, it's actually not biocompostable. Bio-based materials are all of those materials where we focus, where the focus is actually on what they're made of, whether they're organic or inorganic materials. So what is the raw material that we're using and is it biological? Yes, it is biodegradable, actually means all of those, sorry, it actually means that all of those materials that are possibly broken down by microbes under very specific conditions, and these set of conditions that and these are a set of conditions that we create. Being biocompostable takes it to a whole other level. Um, this means that the complete microbial breakdown and the assimilation into compost uh, needs to be within about 180 days to be classed as that, or less. Um, but when it's longer, we work towards it being biodegradable. And these are the steps towards understanding how we categorise biomaterials. So all of these materials can actually be categorised in hundreds of different ways. Um, and one example that we've used here today is to differentiate them into crafted and grown materials, uh, which is how they do it in Amsterdam and is a little bit how we've decided to show you the material evidenced here today. Other people categorise them by what they are used for. Um, so are they imitating plastics or bricks or yarns? What are their applications? Um, 
today's material is perhaps closer to a leather. Uh, so it's categorizing, so this is categorizing can happen when we discuss them in the closest way to maybe the way they may perform. Society somehow needs a way to relate to these new materials. So when we talk about it being a microbial leather, it isn't a real leather, but somehow the properties of the material imitates our leathers. And it is a way for us to communicate the work and the research that we're doing and trying to explain what are the alternatives and what are we proposing. Keeping in mind all of these are possible alternatives where we need to understand the possible futures and complications of it. We can also categorise them under raw materials and made materials. And both of these are extremely important when we think of the different elements that we might choose to craft together. Uh, so when we need to understand what raw we would need to understand what raw materials can be used and in which ways we could use them together with different techniques to develop new materials. We can sort of think of them as two main categories, bioplastics all the of all different types, and then bio-leathers, or alternatives to leathers and alternatives to plastics. Uh, so why plastics? Well, in general, plastics can be fantastic for uh, material as a material for certain aspects. And in fact, not everything about plastic is entirely bad. It's a material that lasts for a very long time. So it can be perfect when we design something that needs to last for a very long time. However, it is when we use it to build something that only needs to last, say, 45 minutes, like a plastic carry bag, um, that we come into a lot of trouble. So we need to focus on trying to design our materials together with the design of our products and actually create material that follows fu its functionality afterwards and not just taking a material because it's so easily mouldable, such as plastic. Plastics are a substance on, um, that our Earth cannot digest. Uh, this quote comes from the Plastic uh, Pollution Coalition. So what are plastics and where do they come from? The initial resource like uh, petroleum comes from the planet, but they, undergo, uh, but they are synthetic because they undergo synthetic processes. However, through the process they become plastics. This is a small overview from the Plastic Pollution Coalition where they very clearly position eight issues with plastics. Um, the first one being that it never goes away because it takes forever to break down uh, and it also spoils our underground, undergrounds, um, it gets into our waterways, um, polluting uh, our waterways and threatening our wildlife and it also costs billions of dollars to abate. Here we focus on leather lookalikes or materials that are a big shift away from traditional leather, the processing of which has had a bad, which has a bad environmental impact, including synthetic leathers, which are made from petroleum-based products. Microbial leather, uh, fish leather, fruit leather, food waste algae leather, temper leathers made from fungi, lab-grown leather, which is generated um, by engineering tissue, um, and there are many examples such as coconut, pineapple leathers, fruit leathers. Then we have microbial leather, which is what we're looking at today. It's a bit hard to see in the picture, but this is actually our kombucha growing. <laughs> and there's bubbles emerging. Um, so kombucha has been available um, worldwide for a very long time. Um, it is a fermented tea drink. Uh, that grows a SCOBY, or a symbiotic culture, um, a colony of bacteria and yeast on its surface. Uh, the bacteria feeds on the sugars and the teas that are in the solution, and then it's able to create a very acidic environment and spin layers of cellulose. Then these layers of cellulose can be harvested uh, and dried, and then treated with different techniques and different recipes uh, for example, we've treated ours with beeswax and coconut oil after drying. What is created is, or grown <laughs> is a material which is somewhere between a leather, a plastic and a paper. 
It can still be very soft and very pliable, depending on with how we treat it afterwards. And it can also be very dry and brittle, almost like a paper, which we've also got some samples of. The biomaterials are grown and harvested from the SCOBY um, during the kombucha manufacturing process. This known process is focused on producing the healthy drink alternative uh, and results, the resulting SCOBY byproduct is currently very underutilised as a material resource. Early research shows that the material can be cultivated, harvested, processed and treated to be a new bio-efficient, energy neutral and fully biodegradable material. The new material has the potential to replace animal-based products such as leathers or flexible synthetic materials such as plastic or even synthetic leathers. During this material experimentation, we explored the effects of the materials using local Vietnamese teas, uh, sugars and other ingredients to grow the biomaterial. This allowed us to ascertain what effects local food and food waste sources could have on the characterisation of the materials. After the growing period, local crafted solutions to drying and forming food-based products such as rice wraps were explored in the context of drying our new biomaterial outcomes. The fashion and textiles industry are arguably one of the largest polluters of the world, in the world. Consumerism and fast fashion have impacted our lives and the consequences on our environment have been cat catastrophic. The current linear economy model means we take from our world's limited natural resources, then we make low quality items out of them, which in turn encourages the consumer to dispose of worn out and cheap items. The fashion and textile industry annually produce more than 1.2 billion tonnes of bulk, in which, can turn in wi sorry, which in turn contributes to considerable environmental impacts. End-of-life textiles are harmful to our environment as popular synthetic fibres such as polyester can take up to 200 years to decompose. Furthermore, in the process of decomposing, the materials release methane, a harmful greenhouse gas. They also produce microplastic particles. Additionally, we have seen rising issues with an abundance of plastic waste. And Vietnam is currently at a crucial point with plastic pollution. Its growing economy has driven it to be the third largest plastic producer by Asia-Pacific nations per capita. Between 1990 and 2015, plastic consumption in Vietnam rocketed from 3.8 kilos per year to 41 kilos per year. In turn, this has created over 1.8 million tonnes of annual plastic waste. Unsustainable design practices are a significant problem that should be of importance to all designers as the negative outcomes are far-reaching if no action is taken. Plastic waste continues to cause considerable environmental problems as the materials are backfilled into our landfills and into our oceans. In nature, there is no waste. All natural materials and all natural systems offer an energy source for the next stage in the process. This means nothing is classified as unusable and all natural components feed the cycle of life. Every molecule in the system has a purpose. So why did we undertake this research? More specifically, we really wanted to find out the future opportunities for Vietnam and specifically with the local bioeconomies. What food sources could we use? How could we use local drying methods to make these new materials? So how did we do it? Uh, well, step one was we make a tea-based solution. Um, it's 1% tea, uh, such as green tea, erlang tea, herbal tea, 10% sugar, whether that's white sugar, uh, brown sugar, or fruit sucrose, and 10% liquid kombucha from the mother. So we always keep a mother tank, and we use some of that liquid to produce the next materials. Step two is to grow the materials. Um, optimised temperature is about 28 degrees, 
is difficult at times in Saigon. We reach way above that. Um, we use muslin fabric to grow the covering, uh, cover the growing containers. And we grow until the depth of the scoby is about four to five millimetres in depth. Mostly it takes about 14 days. Uh, step three is we harvest the scoby. We wash off all of the residue. Uh, we soak the scoby in um, water and washing up liquid to get rid of the residue. And step four is we dry and waterproof the scoby. Uh, we dry it on a flat um, bamboo basket um, and we dry it at room temperature with a fan. Afterwards, when we've got the dry material, we apply the coconut oil and beeswax uh, onto the surface, which helps preserve it and also helps to waterproof the fabric. So we've tested potential of Vietnam and Vietnamese ingredients. Uh, these include um, different teas. We've, cho we've chosen black tea, uh, oolong tea, and different herbal teas. Uh, that also included um, butterfly pea tea, which is probably one of our most interesting results. We also tested different ingredients um, such as fruits and fruit wastes, mainly as an alternative to the sugar sauce. So uh, we've tried red watermelon, coconut, red dragon fruit, white dragon fruit, uh, many actually, you'll, you'll see them today. Uh, and a lot of the time we were able to eliminate the sugar usage by using the fruits. In fact, in one sample that we have here today, we've actually been able to eliminate the tea and the sugar by just using fruit and still growing the biomaterials. We also tested different Vietnamese um, sugars, uh, white sugars, brown sugars, rice malt uh, and cane sugar syrup. To date this year, we've grown over 100 samples in a lab space at RMIT um, in Saigon. Uh, we've tested and evaluated. We've also been on many field trips uh, to see how uh, we might look at drying options. So we went out and looked at how they dry rice wraps uh, and have used some of those bamboo mattresses to dry the biomaterials. Uh, the results we are currently measuring subjectively. So we've had some great um, panels and interview panels and we've asked people uh, to describe their handle, their touch, their smell, um, the transparency of them. We've also sent them away for some objective testing. So we're testing them for tear testing, strength testing, wear testing, the types of testing we might do on other types of textiles and materials. And we're also testing the actual solution that we've been growing them in to find out exactly what bacteria and yeast types we've been growing them in. Some recent research um, indicates that there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, different bacteria and yeast that wildly colonate the liquid. Uh, so we're also testing to find out exactly what we've been growing them in. So we have created a library of new materials and we now invite you to explore some of these today. We'll happily get them out to show you. Uh, each of them um, tells you on them what they uh, have been growing in for how many days uh, and what the results were. Um, we'd love to share them with you and we hope that we get lots of feedback from you about what you think about the new biomaterials and maybe like what you think um, the biomaterials might be used for in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think one of the most interesting is possibly the butterfly PT, which there's another sample there as well. Um, I think some of the teas and fruits also changed the colour, uh, the tactility, um, whether they turned out more like a paper or more like a leather, uh, it certainly changed the tactility of them a lot. Yeah. I think too, this is a really interesting one. This is the, the, the watermelon, pure watermelon, which is actually produced, this is more like a tissue paper, but it's very fragile. So if we pass this one around, please, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> Please be careful with it. We, we've only managed to produce a little piece at the end, but uh, it has no tea and no sugar. It's just grown using watermelon uh, waste juice. Uh, it's sort of got a very pearl-like luster to it as well. It's very shiny. You love it? They love it? <laughs> um, you may notice some have holes in them. <laughs> uh, this was actually because um, with some of them where we've used um, fruit juices or also natural sugar cane, uh, we had a bit of a reaction um, in that they, we made produce too much yeast we made giant bubbles inside the growing containers, uh, and so we also ended up with holes in the fabric. So it was a it was a big learning experience. <laughs> yes, uh, this one here is actually dyed afterwards. So although we grew a lot of them with the butterfly PT, this one was dyed afterwards, and I think we've got it in some plastic, but you can feel inside it. It's probably the material that feels and behaves the most like plastic. Um, so go ahead and try that one too. <laughs> We'd love any questions or any feedback you have on our materials. <laughs> any resources in Vietnam we haven't tapped into. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, can you uh, um, just got a quick question? So normally it has to be in a sort of tea kombucha environment that allows this uh, scoby to grow, right? Mm -hmm. But you've found some success with just like fruit, um, so which would be more ideal um, in in kind of going forward? Mm, I, good question. I, I think that it was a bit of a surprise to us that it would grow without um, without the tea uh, and the sugar, and we we started by just trying it because we thought that the sugar and fruit would help, uh, but in actual fact, when we took out the tea, it still worked. I think the potential of that is that we can tap into food sources um, and the potential of looking at uh, food waste as a potential to feed it rather than looking at these materials as needing the potential food that we also need to eat as being the resource. Um, it gives us the potential of looking at food waste as a way of feeding new biomaterials. I think one of the learnings from that is that the, it's the sugar that's really important and, and the, uh, how that's, I mean, we were quite surprised at how far away we could move from tea. Um, and I think that's a, a, another really important point then rather than consuming, you know, rather than, I suppose it's like some of the, the biopetrols that have been developed that use the food source, you know, they end up being very um, expensive, but also they're, they're basically competing with other human needs. So. Um, looking at food waste will be the, one of the main things we're going to look at next. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, from your samples that I have um, tried to touch and um, see what they made from, um, I think they feel um, Although, as you said, they are somewhere between a leather um, paper and, um, yeah, they, they have a hybrid. So um, I, I wonder if, uh, in, in, point, in terms of user experience, do you plan to um, make it increasingly, increasing the technology to make it more like leather or more like paper or, um, um, or do you plan to keep it as it is, as unique as this material would feel like, and then um, 
if, if, if that happens, then um, how do you um, uh, convince the users uh, to, to that material? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think that's why we've tried to, although it's, like you say, a bit like a leather, a bit like a paper, a bit like a plastic, I think we feel quite strongly that instead of aligning with those terminologies or those materials, that we hope to be able to find the, um, the areas or the applications that these materials could be into, um, rather than trying to make them as similar to existing materials as we can. And you're right, there's a big, there's a big bit there where we have to change the consumer mindset as well um, and think what that will, um, what that will look like. Certainly for this stage of the project, um, we did just have a small group discussion um, with some other experts to see what they thought the potential would be, and we hope we hear from you today what that might be. Um, the next stage of the process, which I think also might answer, we're just applying for some funding at the moment to hopefully take it into the communities. Uh, and see how when they grow up with the food waste that's in their communities and look at applications within their communities that that might help us to overcome um, some of those challenges. I mean, there has been, Stella McCartney's done a whole lot of work on, on uh, kombucha-based imitation leather um, and there's patents and things being developed around that. So that idea of, I suppose, I mean, it's, it's commercially useful if you can actually come up with a material substitute, but it sort of limits you, I think, in terms of imagination if you're, if you're constantly referring back to what already exists. I mean, we know this from, you know, theories of innovation, that it's really hard for people to imagine new uses or new ways of doing things, and they, they initially perhaps need a metaphor that links them back to what currently exists. So... Um, I think it's useful to have those examples of, uh, and the work that's being done on leather or leather-like materials. But the potential for, for new, new areas of application, particularly in communities um, where people might, might actually come up with a new use for it or a new sort of um, perception, I, th I think that's really where the um, interesting stuff lies. And, and I think another interesting thing is if you think about in comparison to textiles, you know, where you've got that whatever the fibre source and then the harvesting of it and the, the refining of it into yarns and then the manufacturing of it, what's really interesting with this is that you end up with a textile-like material without, you know, from, from raw ingredients to the substance sort of in one, one or two and quite simple steps. So I think the potential for communities to work with it, particularly in, an, in a country like Vietnam where you've got uh, people who can work, you know, on all sorts of different scales, I think is a really interesting one. Yeah, uh, thank you for your answer. I think, I think it's, it's really important that um, the users can feel this material because like, in using this material, they're also experiencing new sensations, those that are, they haven't experienced with traditional materials. So, um, yeah, it's very great to hear your plans and what you plan to do with this material. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, so I'm from Vietnam National University uh, School of Science. So, technically, my school had a uh, uh, department of uh, microbiology. It's uh, and many types of microbiome. So, uh, I have questions that uh, have, uh, have your group think about um, international um, uh, um, international con um, uh, conference conference on uh, these issues because I'm thinking that uh, if you want to implement this in Vietnam, you need more people from microbiology sector. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting too. We, we are hoping with the next stage that we're just applying for funding with, um, we will be working with people from other disciplines um, to do exactly that. I think you're right, it's a transdisciplinary subject. New materials also needs very new insights from many different traditional domains to move it forward, so um, we totally agree, and we hope that the next round of funding will um, will get that and be able to move forward with working with um, different people to do that. 
I think one of the things in terms of our perspective, it's been from a design perspective, and that's, I think, I suppose it allows you to think more openly about how it could be used or how it could be developed. But certainly in terms of taking it forward into whether, whether it's different forms of commercialisation or understanding the, the sort of characterisation of it, understanding the different physical properties that it's got, but, um, and also things like treatments for... I don't know, waterproofing or uh, preventing decay. Those are the sorts of areas that I think is really important in terms of collaborating with, with scientists, material scientists, bioscientists. So there's lots and lots of space there. I mean, there's a lot of work going on in those areas internationally, but often if it's just from a science perspective, it tends to be about those things, about characterisation or a particular set of behaviour. And we think that bringing a design approach sort of opens that up a bit and it's positive for, for scientists and for designers and for people who might want to develop businesses. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, it's really interesting what you're doing here. So I have a question, like, do have you tested the, the material? Like, is it is playable or printable or, like, draw on it? Uh, that is an interesting question. Um, we we have begun testing, I guess, in a more scientific way, the characterizations of it, and in in that we've been we've got capability to do it in a way that's textile related. So that's how we've started. We've started by testing them uh, in a way that we can test textiles like tearability, wearability, stretchability, um, flexibility and some subjective ones, like we were talking about tactility and the way it feels, but we haven't checked um, like if we can draw on it so much yet, or um, there has been some examples of people that have 3D printed cellulose-like materials, not specifically when it's been dried like that into a kombucha, uh, but definitely there's a lot of capability in that area. It's the sort of thing that it's great to have designers and artists to collaborate with. We've put some through in Auckland through our digital printer. I mean, it, it prints. We've had students, Pacifica students, using tapa cloth, which is a, a felted vegetable material for digital printing. And this prints quite like that. But it depends a bit on how you surface it. You know, if you put an oil surface on it first, it doesn't print. But there's, you know, so there's a lot of room for experimentation with surfaces and things. Um, with that. So, yeah, collaborations and uh, workshop opportunities, that's what we hope to do in the next series of projects. Uh, okay, so as I understand, like, you, you have the kombucha and you flatten it and then you dry it and waterproof it later words, right? Have you tried make it like a string, like leather string? Yeah, people have been doing work like that. We haven't... Oh, oh. Um, Claudine did some work, didn't she, where she... Uh, I think one of the things is it grows flat, so it's a bit like... That's why we keep calling it a textile, because it's flat like that. Um, there have been some... And we also did, did do some work a couple of years ago about trying to form it while it was growing, but it's quite complicated because it really just wants to grow on the surface of a liquid, so you get all of those problems with, you know, varying it spatially. Um, I think also the other, your question before about testing it and characterisation and things is that because it's a bio-based material, there's, there's a, a set of standards, if you like, for testing textiles, as Donna said, you know, the tearing and uh, strength and stretchability and things. But there's also a whole set of standards from other areas, for example, biodegradability that, that will come in from, from science areas. So actually to develop a set of tests that are really, you know, sort of 360 on the material is also a really interesting challenge and that requires uh, interdisciplinarity. Yeah, so something we don't have standards for at the moment, so it's actually a paper we're looking at writing at the moment, which is the fact that there, there aren't measurable standards for these new biomaterials. You can write on it? You can write on it? On it. We can, we can write a paper about it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. about the problem, not on it. But I'm sure you could, if you ever wanted to test it out for us, we could send you some material. <laughs> because, like, I'm, this is my teacher, 
and we are holding two different samples. And the one one I am holding is really is really strong, relatively. And the one he's uh, holding is crunchier, and it's like it's like rice paper. And when it's dry, right? Do you know that feeling? Mm -hmm. So like, uh, I think if it's consistent of the string to bond to each other, it's gonna be much stronger. I think that because like basically fabric, fabric is made like that, right? So that From is yarn. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, like, uh, have you tried eating eat, eating it? Uh, not personally, but lots of people do. I mean, you can make dog treats out of it, you can eat it. And I think that's where it has a great potential in food wraps yeah. um, that, you know, are, are only single use. You know, sometimes we think about these as being leathers, and if we do, we're thinking about, you know, um, handbags and shoes and things that we want to last for a long time. But actually, there's no harm in wrapping our food in this and throwing it straight into the um, compost pile. So we, we can think of them as those very quick short uses instead as well, um, which is what we shouldn't be using plastic for. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so one last question. I'm, I'm kind of like interested in how it reacts, this material. Have you tried exposed it under the, the lights? Like paintings, you know paintings? After a while, when you expose it to, to the sun too much, mm -hmm. it loses it Fades. Colors mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so we haven't done any scientific testing in that area, but we do know that the ones that we grew with the fruit um, or with the tea, such as the pink ones from the um, butterfly pea tea, they hold their colour, they fade less or hold their colour more when we grew them with the tea than when we dyed them with the tea afterwards. Um, but it was honestly just through a matter of growing them and having them in the office that we've seen that. We, we haven't done any testing in that area. Mm. Okay, so very... <laughs> Given the way that natural dyes behave, yeah. um, most of them will, be, will fade with light. Um, but again, it's, it's, these are all quite specific issues that actually need projects on yeah. them. Uh, because, as Donna was saying, there's something about the combination of the colour and the, bact the bacteria and fungi that may hold colour better or, or not as well. Um, so there's just too many, there's too many different factors. And I suppose in this particular round of experiments, we were looking at different materials um, more than um, we were at the, I suppose, the sort of longer term testing of, of specific factors. Yeah, like I think that what users, potential users might curious about. So I'm just, I'm just asking to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, do get in contact with us and hopefully if we get to do the project again, then you know, maybe you'd be interested in having some of the kits in your communities and growing them with us and seeing how they go. I'll come back. Uh, I, I just come back from the morning, so I have two questions. Um, first of all, I believe that this is very interesting and it can like, pave the way to the fashion industry, but is there any chance that it, is, it can be incorporated into other industries like interior design? Because you mentioned the mix uh, and the combination with the light, and I just come up with the idea of like the lamp, it can be the coat of the lamp, and, and I see that the transparency of these materials are giving the different effect than on the um, industrial materials that already exist in the market. Mm -hmm. So do you think, it is, is there any chance of um, new industries can involved in these materials? And the second question, uh, I um, think that I, I see that the um, people, when they take the materials, they Many of the, many of us uh, smell the materials, and I think that it can create like the perfume that that is attached to materials as well. So, do you believe that it can like open the new products or new way of uh, perfumes on the perfume market? Yeah, these are my questions. Do you want to answer me? I think we'd, we'd both say definitely yes. I mean, by by framing it as textiles, people immediately think fashion, 
but textiles are used in all sorts of different areas, and it doesn't have to be used as a textile. So absolutely, I mean, I think interiors is a really good example. Um, and also, the, the, whether it's the different sensory aspects of it as a material, the, the touch, the transparency, the smell, all of those are things that, of course, can be worked with. I mean, you know, with the industrial production of textiles, we tend to lose that, the things, particularly with the sense of smell. But, I mean, if you, you, know, if you think about when you work with, with, from New Zealand, we work with wool, and if you work with raw wool, it's a totally, totally different, you know, the smell is a really different experience um, from going and buying a, a jumper in a, in a department store. So I think that, and silk as well, isn't it? Raw, I mean, um, raw silk, I mean, that all materials have got, have got their sensory qualities. And I think that's an important point. Like, how do we bring, bringing, bringing those back into our lives in some way that sort of connects us to the natural world, I think is really important. So, yes. I mean, I think the other great thing with this is it's a very easy, available technology. You know, to start the SCOBY, I mean, I've got stuff growing at home, and I just started it by having a, um, a container with tea and sugar leaving it exposed to the air. I think I put in a, a, a can of kombucha as well, an organic kombucha. But that's all you need, and then you can start. So it's not a patented technology. It's a, it's an, it's a widely available one. So that's what's really interesting in terms of sort of um, how people can be innovative with it. it doesn't, you, you don't need a whole lot of equipment to start doing it. Yeah. I was just going to add to that about the smell because some of them, they mostly you can smell the after effects of it. You can smell the coconut oil and the beeswax that we've applied, but certainly some of them smell sweeter than others and they have a very sugary, sweet smell. Um, so that would be interesting in a light, you know, if it heats up a little bit, um, they certainly behave a little bit differently and maybe they would set off some sort of scent. But we did notice a... A quite a, a sweetness to the smell. <laughs> and probably we'd have to give a sensory warning that when you're growing it, if you start growing it in large containers in a closed sm space, it produces an overwhelming vinegary smell. So um, you do need a bit of air circulation. In fact, we got shut down <laughs> in the lab at RMIT because the staff uh, felt like it smelt too much in the area we were in, but um, we were actually able to compensate that by having coffee grinds and other things in the room that helped uh, using natural cloth to cover the containers, whereas we were using anything we could at the beginning. We started co covering them with natural materials. That helped as well. So um, those were some of the other findings that we had. And also not letting the room get too warm. Uh, that also produced big bubbles. Um, but it also increased the smell because the yeast and the bacteria increased. So that's another another part. In, in New Zealand, we had the problem in the winter that it was just too cold and it took months to grow. In Saigon, they had the problem it was growing too quickly. Maybe maybe Hanoi is a good a good medium. I don't know, but definitely temperature is an issue. Okay, uh, uh, as far as I know, the uh, ingre uh, ingredient is easily disposable. And do you think of any uh, way of restoration uh, to keep this, uh, keep this mm, piece of kombucha for a longer good condition? That's a good question, yeah. So it is fully biodegradable, and that's one of the good parts about it is that every microbe in it can be fully um, broken down, and, and that's what we like about it. Um, but there are ways probably of treating it, like we have with the beeswax, um, that will give it longevity, like you're asking, and also waterproofing and things like that. And it may be that we have to redo that, like you might with a leather or a beeswax wrap, that you a food wrap that we have now, you know, the food wraps that are made with beeswax that you can mould over your food, where you actually have to reapply the wax every few months to keep it good. So maybe it would be that if you wanted to keep it for longer, you would have to reapply the um, beeswax to the surface. Um, but 
the good part about it is that it's fully biodegradable so um, and, and it breaks down quickly. So that's also the part you like. Mm. Um, I, uh, I want to revisit the point uh, that you said before that um, this material is a easily grown uh, technology at home. So I really like that part because um, designers who are not scientists could utilize this um, technology to experiment with materials. Um, but at the same time, I'm concerned about the question uh, that to be able to make a product that can um, maybe had the potential to go into mass production. Um, we need a lot of samples to experiment with. And um, as small design teams or even just one individual, it's really hard to general, uh, generate that, such an ama amount of samples alone. Um, so I wonder, uh, do you have any advice for young designers and individuals and also small groups? Uh, if they want to explore this material, uh, um, this process of producing the material, and then um, maybe in an efficient way, so that they could experiment with it more than the time they spend growing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah I, I think I guess that's also our next steps. Like, how will we um, work with communities to grow it? What what sort of um, uh, kits do we need to give them or what sort of information do we need to give them and that may include designers we've, we've sort of in the process of that um, you're right manufacturing or mass manufacturing would would change it completely and I think a good example of that in Vietnam would be rice wraps that we went and had a look at there's a lot of micro manufacturing in in uh, you know, in small communities in Vietnam that are still making rice wraps a traditional way and drying them in an hour out in the sunshine. Um, but there's also mass production of rice wraps in Vietnam. So uh, I think that those micro scales um, are, are really st still really good, really accessible, and it maybe are at least a start um, to also seeing uh, if there's any avenues for that sort of mass production of it. Um, but sometimes small is beautiful. <laughs> we don't have to go to mass production. <laughs> so standardising, it's always going to be, you know, you could standardise it commercially, but standardising it in a way that everybody in any place can do is probably a little bit um, unpredictable. However, I think there's probably different sorts of recipes and combinations and also different sort of surface treatments where you could get some testing done generically that other people could use that information. I mean, there is some information about different projects people have done and different testing regimes they've put them through, but it's very academic, um, more sort of scientific type of um, publications. So we ho as designers, we're hoping to make, you know, that some of the work that we do could start to provide some pathways that wouldn't give you absolute certainty that this product could be guaranteed for X, but you'd know that using a particular process would give a dependable result. Um, and I think that's how it will have to go at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. I currently work in the textile industry, so I'm kind of standing in the point of view of industry. Uh, so first of all, during your test, you, do you think about potential to combine it with the finishing uh, pr process in the textile industry, like put it on the yarn, knitting, uh, weaving, mm. or printing, or embroidery mm. in it? Uh, yeah, I think they're all processes that certainly could be looked at. And if you think about synthetic leathers, they are often um, bonded to another material as well. Um, so there's a capability of, of that for them. Um, the other thing that has been explored in a, in a design sense has been that it, that it grows to the shape of the container. So in effect, we could be, although not a yarn, we could actually be growing pieces of clothing to the shape um, because it grows to the container size. So you could actually have a, a bodice block 
uh, or a skirt block and you could grow the material to the exact shape that you need um, because it grows to the surface of the container. So although we've grown them all as sample sizes to test, the potential I think is also in the fact that it grows to any shape. Um, and there has been a lot of work done like that. Uh, Susanna Lee was probably one of the most famous uh, and the very first entrepreneur with kombucha materials um, where she actually grew a jacket by growing it to the shape of the different elements of a, of a garment. Yeah. It shrinks as it dries, yeah. We've only done a little bit of work, but that idea of composite materials and combining them is a really, we think, got a lot of potential. Um, we did do some growing kombucha with us onto silk fibre, and that was incredibly beautiful. It produced um, an amazing uh, result. But, I mean, we just, that was one of our, our master's students who did that, and we haven't taken that further yet, but that's another really interesting possibility, certainly in terms of giving more strength to the material. And I also have a question about the colouring and the dyeing. As I see all the sample are natural colour. Hmm. So can we combine it with the pigment to give it the colour we want? Hmm. So it dyes very well. It's a cellulose material, so if you dye it with um, artificial dyes as well, of course, it's going to take very well. Um, we've only used the coloration from the growing process or from the same materials that we grew it with or the same food sources like the butterfly PT, making it like a dye solution and dyeing it afterwards. Um, so we've used the only the same processes and the same sources of food to, to do that with. But it, it takes dye very, very well. It's a cellulose material, so it's, it's, um, it's very easily coloured. Mm. When we tried it on the digital textile printer, it printed really well. So it's, yeah. Sorry, one last question. Uh, we know how long it makes, how about how long it's going to dispose? It, just, it um, biodegrades very quickly. It biodegrades faster than an oak leaf, so faster than six months um, if put into the right conditions to decompose. Yeah. But it also doesn't decompose as, as it is like that, uh, as it needs the biodegradable conditions to do that. But that's an area of testing that we haven't done. Um, that's probably, again, we can get some scientists more involved um, because also what conditions it biodegrades and if it's in salt water, if it's in fresh water, if it's sitting on the earth, all of those things we just we don't know at the moment. One of the biggest parts, apart from the food sources that we chose, which was what the, the sort of initial inspiration for working in Vietnam here was the, the localised food sources, but also lo the drying uh, methods that could be used here. So in New Zealand, we had uh, dried them. We tried several ways, like drying a fruit leather in a um, dehydrator. Uh, and we had also dried them more naturally there. And there's a lot of problems with those. If you dry them too quickly in a dehydrator, um, it or too slowly. If it's too slowly, it generally goes mouldy, and if it's too quickly, uh, it just shapes up at the corners. It just dries into big... Some of those were a bit like that. Um, and so that was also the interest, was to have a look at ways that we could dry them using local methods here. And the, the rice wraps were the most um, favourable <laughs> when we dried them like that. Um, it's a similar time frame to drying it. Um, it didn't allow them to go mouldy, but also didn't let them curl up. Um, most research before this has been done by drying it between wooden planks uh, or drying it on screens like a paper. Um, so that was also part of our interest, was looking at uh, localised solutions for drying. Mm. Yes, thank you for all your sharing. <laughs> You're welcome. It also made all the beautiful patterns, which I think is another way that designers could engage with the material, is the fact that it takes up the pattern or the shape that you dry it on. So, um, you know, ours was the bamboo mattresses, but the potential for the patterns that you could have through drying it, I think, are, um, are really exciting. Yes, some of the weaving patterns could be great. <laughs> I think we can finish it up there. I don't know where Leanne's gone. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for coming. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be here with the samples. If you have any more questions, then feel free to, to just come up and approach us. Yeah, but thank you.
Thank you for your engagement too. They were, that was um, wonderful to hear from you all and your enthusiastic response to it. So keep in touch. Let us know if you want to find out more. Yeah, write to us. Let us know. <laughs> Thank you so much.